Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Holly Randall Unfiltered. Today, I have the lovely Adria Ray in the studio. Adria, can I just say that I love the lingerie jean jacket look you have going on right now? <laughs> Thank I you. I wanted to wait until we were rolling to compliment you, but I'm like so down with this look. I love it. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's it's casual work. work. It's like casual sexy, but yeah. also then you've like got the glasses in there. So it's like she also could read books too. She, she could be a very like well-rounded. Yeah. I mean, like lady. she could just take off the jacket and take off the glasses and suddenly she's in like a sexy lacy teddy. She's ready to go. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, she could like keep this ensemble going and she could like read you some Shakespeare. Can you never know. Dinner. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like so many opportunities with this outfit. It's fantastic. Yeah, it's it's very, and you got to add the sneakers with it. So then you're like, she could run away at any time too. Yeah, you never know. You better hold her interest because she could just be at that fucking door in seconds. <laughs> I also love the blonde hair. This is new. Thank you. Yes, it is. So this is like new as of like a month ago. And you're loving it? I am. I am really loving life as a blonde. Yeah, it's it's great. It's, it we are the best. <laughs> it is. Well, you know, as a brunette your whole life, you're like... Mm. <laughs> Yeah. You always want to be a blonde. And then, like, I feel like now that I'm here, it's like, it's better than I expected. Okay. So, question Do you, because I've always been a blonde my whole life. I'm mm -hmm. actually like a natural blonde. So, do you feel that like you get more attention as a blonde or are you treated differently? No, definitely. Really? Yeah. Like, every single person that has commented on my, me changing my hair mm -hmm. has said something along the lines of me looking like a bombshell mm -hmm. or like a vixen or like something more sexy than mm -hmm. what I used to look like. Right. <laughs> so, I will say that I think the, brown hair just made me look more like younger yeah i think too and yeah. i think the blonde hair makes me look a little bit more like womanly I guess. right right do, do you find that like strangers treat you differently like i mean the guy was very nice to me downstairs who opened the door for me it was like two of them they're like well let me get the door for you and i was like oh thanks people had never opened the door for you before never in life. Never, never in my life first once. time ever <laughs> <laughs> well i think it looks great i tried to go brunette well, I've never tried to go brunette. I got low lights once and I almost cried. <laughs> I just look so bad on me. It brings out like the red in my face. It's just like, I'm just going to be always be a blonde. I've gone through a lot of really awkward hair like phases. Mm -hmm. um, this is definitely my best one. Mm. Yeah, no, I think it's great. <laughs> yeah, because like last year I tried to do like this like gingery thing. It was like kind of orangey blonde and it was not working. Mm -hmm. And then like I did pink, which was fun, mm -hmm. but like didn't work and yeah. then I did black but I felt like I looked really like exotic and then yeah. everyone was always asking me like what are you yeah and then I would just have to disappoint them by saying I'm really white so <laughs> <laughs> I was like I'm so white I'm mayo like <laughs> Dutch Irish German like very like, very like European mutt yeah, yeah. I guys same here <laughs> it's okay it's yeah okay. but with the black hair it definitely made me look kind of like um I don't know, like, uh, I got, like, Bosnian once, and then some other guy asked me if I was Armenian here. Okay. And then I, I got, like, Latina a lot. Yeah. Okay. But I think in SoCal, I think everybody just assumes that you're that living here. Right, right. I guess, you know, the best way to probably determine, like, what ethnicity you look like is to shoot a porn scene and see, like, what category they put you in. <laughs> you know, like how Vicky Chase is Mexican, but, like, they put her in exactly. Asian <laughs> All the, all the time. time because like people think she's Asian because they think she looks true. Asian. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> because it's like the last acceptable industry where you, you can, can like, like racially yeah, divide people and stereotype people. Mm -hmm. Like so you can package, you know, like Latina Whatever. sex babes and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So that's probably the best way to like get an idea. That in the of food industry is the only place you can racially oh yeah that's true things. that's true but I feel like it's more acceptable in the food industry right because it's more like about culture yeah I think whereas for Porn's us it's a little bit about culture too though yeah I would say yeah because yeah. like you grow up with a certain culture sometimes you're attracted to that right or sometimes if you grow up with a certain culture you're attracted attracted to the complete opposite to the opposite because right. you're not used to it yeah, yeah yeah that makes sense but porn is such a weird psychology like human psychology thing yeah which is, like, kind of what I've learned having to, like, write my own stuff now is, like, having to dig into, like, human psyche and mm -hmm. figure out weird fantasies and fetishes that people have and mm -hmm. why. And it's, you know, the pool of 
human sexual fantasies is just so deep like it's never ending and it's it's crazy the longer you work in the porn industry the more diverse tastes and fantasies that you see and it's it really opens your eyes and it's just fascinating how complex the thing that that really surprised me was I think just kind of like figuring out the weird stuff that I found attractive Mm. that I didn't really notice before and then when I got into porn, I was like, wow, like, I really like collarbones. Like, I love women's collarbones. Really? Like, that's something that to me is like, I think is so sexy, which is like so. Now I'm like, what's my collarbone? Right? Like? <laughs> Isn't it? It's like such a weird thing to think about. But Do like. Collarbone? <laughs> it looks great. <laughs> You're a liar. You're a liar. You didn't mean that. So what? Else? Yeah, I always find it interesting. So many girls talk about how they learn about their sexuality and learn about themselves and their preferences in porn. You know, in this kind of safe production space where they can explore all these different avenues and um, how they really discover themselves. So, what did you find that you were into getting into porn besides collarbones? <laughs> <laughs> like any specific acts or anything like that? Um, getting into porn, uh, I was like very vanilla when I first got in. Mm-hmm. Um, like I remember when it was as a maybe two months in, and because of the agency that I was with, I was with Adriana Chechik and Megan Rain a lot, mm-hmm. and they were like full blown in the middle of like doing anal and all this really like, hardcore stuff. And I remember seeing a butt plug that Adriana had and being like mortified that like she was putting this in her body. Like how could you possibly ever do this? And then, you know, within a year I was like doing the same thing. So there was one thing that like I learned about myself that I was, I wasn't as open in the beginning, but being around so many people and like so many different other people's sexualities, I think it really kind of like opened me up to my own because I was a lot more willing to try certain things that Mm -hmm. I probably wouldn't have ever done in my life ever. I mean, maybe like I'd only ever stuck in like a finger in my butt like Mm -hmm. ever Mm -hmm. before I got into porn. And then you got up to Adriana Chechik size butt plugs. Exactly. I don't know the size you're talking about, but knowing Adriana, (laughs) I could imagine it's an impressive size butt plug. And then also another thing that I learned was that I I really enjoyed rough sex. Mm -hmm. That was one thing that I really liked doing. Um, I liked understanding kind of like the weird psychology behind like wanting to be dominated or Mm -hmm. feeling that primal kind of instinct while you're having sex. Mm -hmm. Um, I really enjoyed that. I found out how much I really like women. Mm -hmm. Like I really like women. Once like I got into porn, I was like, wow, this is like one place that I can really explore that side of my sexuality that Mm -hmm. I never had a chance to back in Michigan Mm because being gay where I'm from is still kind of, it's like still kind of on the edge of like being accepted. Like Mm -hmm. people aren't assholes about it, but they're definite, like people who are gay are definitely still talked about in like a bad manner behind Mm -hmm. their backs. So it was always something that I was, very scared of like exploring when I lived there because I was like it's such a small town and I know people are gonna find out and like god forbid and but then I just and then ended up doing it on the internet anyways so yeah. <laughs> and then everyone found out for sure <laughs> <laughs> but at least I don't have to live there and deal with them so right it's a lot better doing it here versus where I came from yeah so I want to ask you actually about um you enjoying rough sex Mm -hmm. because there's a lot of people who feel like, you know, you hear the age old porn is degrading to women. Mm -hmm. Look at these examples of these rough scenes where girls are getting like choked and like dick slapped and all this kind of stuff. I had somebody post this comment on my YouTube channel the other day and they were like, why is all porn like this? Like why do women always have to be victimized? Mm -hmm. And I was like, trying to explain to them like some girls actually enjoy this kind of sex play and so can you maybe like tell us a little bit more about that and and why you enjoy it Mm -hmm. and do you like talk to your partner first about kind of how far they can take it you know what I mean Mm -hmm. so for me like if I'm if I'm engaging in rough sex with somebody I always try to talk with them before Mm -hmm. just because I do have a past of like physical abuse and so like there are certain things for me that like it can take it a little too far and can ruin the entire (laughs) mood of everything yeah and it's uh maybe specific 
actions. Exactly. Okay. And so I'll always um, be very vocal with the person before, like, hey, just don't say certain things like this. You know, don't do certain things like that, blah, 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 blah. And, like, we can have all the fun in the world. Mm-hmm. And then, um, the, I mean, the, one of the main reasons that I enjoy it personally is probably because I was physically abused in my past. And it kind of gives me an outlet to be in control of that, if mm-hmm. that makes sense. So it, yeah. it kind of turns something that was a bad experience for me into something that's enjoyable. Mm-hmm. Um, and also, I'm a very intense person. Like, I have a lot of fire in me, especially when I'm having sex. Mm-hmm. And so that can kind of translate into, like, this roughness. Mm-hmm. Um and I think having somebody that kind of matches that energy with me uh, makes me enjoy it more because I feel like we're both kind of indulging in this really intense, really passionate, very kind of primal act with each other where it's like rough and intense. And um, also when you're doing that, you have to be very in tune with each other because you have to be very aware um, of each other's bodies, especially when you're doing a lot of rough stuff. So I think it kind of brings that intensity to like a higher level as mm-hmm. far as like connection and passion and just overall intensity so for me I just like that kind of fiery like thing that goes with it um and probably just the really primal like part of like being dominated as well um I find it I love that you talked about how having that kind of sex actually makes you be more connected with your partner because mm -hmm. they need to be able to kind of read you and because it's so intense whereas I think most people think of it the opposite way whereas like you're really disconnected and like the woman is just an object of like this man's internal anger right so so it's interesting that you you put it in that way because I think so many people can't see it that it could be Mm -hmm. like that and it's also so interesting to me and I hear this from a lot of people and I am by no means (laughs) a psychologist or anything like that but I find that a lot of people talk about using sex and porn to kind of help them heal from trauma almost but in a lot of cases maybe reenacting something similar to whatever trauma Mm -hmm. that they had but within like a safe space with certain boundaries and parameters set so that you know that you can like reenact this for whatever reason and again I don't understand human psychology specifically but (laughs) It's like it's safe for you again. Yeah. And I think it has a lot to do with with power as well, Mm. um, because sex has a lot to do with power dynamics. Yes. And um, when you're put into a situation where you're like physically abused, all of your power is completely taken away from you. And that's kind of what the person gets off on. Mm -hmm. Whereas when you're engaging in rough sex with somebody consensually, you have now all the power in your court. I mean, Mm -hmm. you're trusting them to abide by your boundaries and blah, 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 blah. But you still have the power to stop it whenever you want. You can walk away whenever you want. You can end it the moment that you're uncomfortable. And I Mm -hmm. think that knowing that is the reason that girls are able to feel comfortable and almost kind of blissfully submit into this experience um, because they know they have the power in that situation. Yeah. And I I think that for me is huge when it comes to rough sex. And, and especially on a porn set, which, again, I know mm-hmm. a lot of people think is the opposite. But when you're on a porn set, you're on a production set. So you're surrounded by people. Mm-hmm. So there's no way that this one person is going to take you past your boundaries. You're going to try to stop it. And he's going to essentially not allow you and hold you down. And you know what I mean? Like you have this safety net. This is obviously assuming that you're working with a reputable company and good people. Right. Because <laughs> I know that people have had different experiences with bad directors or whatever. But, you know, you have like an audience there and everybody's working together to create this production. Mm -hmm. So like communications, like the most important thing. Yes. It's huge. And, um, the company that, um, I direct for, we should do a lot of rough sex and we always try to talk to the girls before a lot, Mm -hmm. like very, very transparent, very open. Like this is everything that's happening. We want to know all of your boundaries so the second that we see them being crossed, we can step in and say something in case for whatever reason we don't hear you, something happens, you know, X, Y, Z. Right. And it's just taking care of people on set. You know, the more you take care of your talent, the more willing they are going to be to give you a really great scene. So. Right. And if they feel safe, then exactly. they can kind of lose themselves in the scene. and, and It comes out so more. much better. Yeah. 
So that's a great segue into my next question, <laughs> asking you about directing, because you are directing now, and you're directing for Caden Cross for Deeper, yes, which is awesome, which is like a BDSM site, right? That's what um, you would call yeah, it? Yeah, I would say it's like... Um, I would say it's more along the lines of like female erotica. We mm-hmm. looked, we try to really focus on like what women are kind of wanting to see. I mean, obviously a lot of our members are males, but um, I would say it's BDSM for women mm-hmm. um, because it's not going to be like your typical um, woman roles. A lot of the roles that the women have are like more in power. It's fantasies that they want to be fulfilling, things mm-hmm. like that. And I, I think even for our male viewers, I think that's very sexy because I think just having – or seeing a woman that knows what she wants is kind of very. I, I wonder too if some people who feel guilty about watching porn, because we know there are a lot of them out there, mm-hmm. if a man sees a scene where they see that the woman has agency and that she has power, it like it helps alleviate some of that guilt that exactly. like they might be engaging in something that's mm-hmm. victimizing women. I think the best way that my boyfriend put it for me is that he makes porn that it looks like the women are actually enjoying it. Yeah. Like they're the ones that are actually are fulfilling the fantasies right. and they're the ones that want to be there. And, and I think that is what makes the site so great and such a great thing for me to write for is because I love that it puts the women kind of like in that power mm-hmm. position, even if they're in like a submission type of role, they're still the ones that are putting themselves there because they right. want to be for whatever reason. Yeah. I mean, Anybody who understands the BDSM world knows that the submissive has all the power because the sub sets all the boundaries and the mm-hmm. sub, you know, they, they're the one who creates like the structure of exactly whatever you're going to do. Like the dom has to always abide by whatever the sub's limits are. And mm-hmm. then you can play within that, those boundaries. Yeah, it's a, it's a very um, it's a very it's like a dance almost, mm. you know, back and forth. It's it's very balanced um, as far as power goes yeah. both ways. And it, it's playing with that power back and forth. And that's the soul of BDSM is just playing with that power yeah. and kind of you know, seeing different ways that you can use it. And uh, I think that's what really, like, makes the intensity of the scene is just seeing it kind of, like, bounce back and forth between mm-hmm. two people, whether they're a dom or a sub. Yeah. I mean, power dynamics between people are, are really interesting. And it, you know, obviously seeps into all other aspects of our life. Everything, you know, we're, we're social animals. We all live in this pecking order world. So, like what better place to kind of either switch up those roles or explore those roles more so is in the bedroom, Mm -hmm. you know, sex is like our most primal action. And then you bring in like the social aspects of like human behavior into that. And it's just like this really interesting intoxicating mix, which I think makes BDSM really interesting. It also feels like a very like cerebral form of sex. Mm -hmm. It's a lot more mental for sure. Yeah. So tell me about some of the scenes that you've directed for them, like maybe any particular favorites or recent ones. Could you perhaps tell us like the story or motivation behind it? Like how that went. Um, so one of the first ones that I ever directed was with my good friend Gina Valentina. Mm -hmm. And then I also directed, uh, Damon Dice, um, in that one as well. And they were at a bar and basically it was Damon was, uh, heartbroken over his, uh, ex and was Mm -hmm. moving out of the apartment. So we have this really awesome shot of him just sitting in the apartment. He's downing this bottle of tequila and then he throws it against the wall where there's this picture of him and his ex and it smashes everywhere. And then, uh, he ends up going to the bar and he's sitting there. And then we see Gina, who is this girl that is really just looking for some guy to kind of use that night. And so that's kind of where her, power rule comes in of like, I'm just going to find some guy to use. And so she sees Damon, who is kind of, you know, vulnerable and like upset and goes up to him and kind of starts kind of like talking shit to him Mm -hmm. a little bit. Like, why are you sad at the bar type of thing? And uh, that's when this power dynamic kind of shifts and Damon gets really upset with her and ends up like taking her outside. And as a viewer, you're kind of like worried at first because you're like, oh, no, like this guy is like, now taking this girl to an alleyway, like, what's going to happen? Mm-hmm. But then when you kind of start to realize that, like, this was kind of all part of Gina's plan mm-hmm. was to make him upset and to push his buttons and to get him to do this. So it's kind of like little power dynamics like that, like messing with them mm-hmm. and watching it go back and forth that I love to do in my scripts. Um, mm-hmm. Another one that we did uh, was a little bit different. It didn't really have a power dynamic. It was actually really romantic and sweet. Mm. It was with Small Hands and Venus Guy. 
and I actually ripped American Beauty, that scene where he's laying on the bed and he has all the rose petals falling yeah. on him. And so it's um, small hands. He's laying in bed and he's daydreaming about Vina and uh, she's like this flower shop owner and she's like cutting flowers and rearranging them. And then I had her on like this petal or this bed of roses and had all these petals falling on her and had small hands with petals falling on him and it was just this really kind of cool abstract like dream sequence of like him fantasizing about her Mm -hmm. and then it went into like this very like raunchy kind of like fantasy of him having sex with her and at the end he kind of like wakes up and we don't really we can't really tell if it was a dream or not type Mm -hmm. of thing So that one was, like, a little bit more abstract and a little bit more romantic, but um, it still had, like, a very deeper feel because you're just kind of left wondering, like, what is going on? Yeah, (laughs) yeah. Did he really bang this super hot girl or not? (laughs) (laughs) Um, So it's been really cool. We've been able to do a lot of, like, very creative stuff, and she's given me a lot of of, uh, creative uh, room to do kind of what I want to do, which has been an amazing opportunity for me because it's just, I think it's incredible that somebody trusts me this much to do what I'm doing Mm -hmm. because I started off just doing content um, Mm -hmm. for myself. And so having somebody trust me like with their production and their site is just like, yeah, incredible, especially only being 23. I'm just like, how? (laughs) (laughs) What do you feel like? So how has your perspective on directing or maybe even performing changed since you started working behind the camera? Oh, gosh. I mean, my appreciation for directors has gone out the window. Like I, I probably texted like two or three directors after I went through this nightmare of a shoot and was just like, I'm so sorry. <laughs> For what you have to deal with. I'm so sorry that like, I put you through that time where you had to reschedule me like four times or like, it's just, you get a really big appreciation for what people are doing because it, it's mm-hmm. a lot of moving parts and it's really having to orchestrate them to all come together at once perfectly. Mm-hmm. And my favorite saying that I've now coined is that it's not a porn shoot until everything tries to go wrong at the very last second. Yeah. (laughs) So um, I've definitely gotten a a bigger appreciation, a way bigger appreciation for like the crew members and the things that they do and the long hours that they put in. Yeah. And um, on top of that, I think uh, just being on this side of the camera and being able to like work with talent too, like I definitely have a newfound respect for them as well because – Um, when you get in as like a new girl, I think you kind of are a little overwhelmed because there's just so many girls Mm -hmm. and you're just kind of like, how am I going to find my way in this big industry? Like, where am I going to find my place? And then when you kind of move behind the camera, you kind of realize that everybody has a place. Yeah. Like there is a niche for everybody Mm -hmm. and that you don't have to necessarily be a director's first pick every single time because they might be wanting something else from the company or whatever. And that, Maybe there's a storyline that somebody else fits better. And so I think it's given me more respect for just how many girls are in the industry. Whereas before, I think I felt a little like overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. And now I'm like, thank God there's so many girls because now I have so many more to pick from. And you have so (laughs) many more people to fill in last minute when people cancel on you the morning of. Exactly. You know what we need is more guys in the industry. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. More Sorry, let me rephrase that. Not more random dudes who are DMing me their dick pics and wanting to get in porn who live in Morocco. (laughs) Not those guys. I mean, like, solid male performers who are good looking. genuinely want to work. Genuinely want to work. Their dick works really well. They respect the girls. They can say their lines. They're decent actors. Like... It's huge. We need more of that. And it's also... I think it goes without saying that, like... I don't think they get as much credit as they deserve. No. And I think you don't realize that <laughs> until you're a director. Because I say that all the time. I'm like, like good male talent, they're so underappreciated. Oh, my gosh. Because they are everything. They can make or, bre- or break your scene. A hundred percent. And then also on top of that, it, it doesn't matter. You could have the best female performer mm-hmm. in the world. Yeah. And if you stick her with a guy that's bad, the scene's going to be bad. Yeah. It doesn't matter how good she is. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Like, he's going to make her look bad. Mm-hmm. And that's one thing that I've also learned being a director is that it really comes down to 
the guy that I put the girl with because yeah. if he's going to carry that scene, then she's going to bring it to like that next level. Right. But he's got to be the foundation. Right. That already kind of brings it to where yes. it needs to be. So, yeah. And we've we've got a very small list of people that we use um, for that reason. And now it's just getting smaller and smaller because of, I won't name names, but they keep taking all the male talent. <laughs> you, mean, uh, you mean browsers? <laughs> Signing all the good male talent. Yes, oh, I know. Like breaking my heart. I know. And I work for them. I mean, I work for Twisties, which oh, is that's, my geek that's brand. Right. I, but Twisties only does girl girl. <laughs> and, I don't, and I only shoot boy girl for like other. So believe me, even though I work for Mind Geek, actually they sponsor this podcast. Use. They still screw me on taking all the good male talent. <laughs> so I feel your pain. <laughs> but it's fucking smart because most genius. people like think that it's not you know they don't like mm-hmm. we were just saying they don't give the guys enough credit and they're smart to recognize it. we got to get pull in the solid guys because they are like yep. everything it's true i mean i i just i just directed small hands earlier this week and i was telling him how sad i was that it was probably going to be one of the last times that i i get to direct him but i was just like it's okay i understand wait is he signing with them <gasps> I can say that because it'll come. He already told me the release date, and this will be out before, will, after that. But. Oh my fucking god! Yeah. <laughs> oh my god! I know that's a real loss. Isn't that heartbreaking? Yeah. Oh, si- little side note on rough sex. One of my one of my first scenes that I had done um, when I first got into the industry was with small hands, and mm-hmm. it was like a rougher scene. So we took like a picture together with his hand around my throat. Mm-hmm. And like, I was looking kind of like scared mm-hmm. type of thing. And my mom saw it <laughs> <laughs> and it was like right when she was like first finding out that I was in porn and yeah. she called me like so concerned. Like I saw this tattooed man with his hand around your throat and I'm just really concerned. And I was like, mom, if only you knew this tattooed man, he's literally the sweetest. Yeah. Man. Small hands has got to be one of the nicest people in the industry. He's Hands an down. angel. It was so sweet. That's and like so funny still to this day, like I'll say his because it's such a distinctive name. Yeah. And still to this day, she'll be like, oh, that guy that was choking you. <laughs> I had small hands on this podcast. You guys go back and watch it. And he cried on the podcast when I when he talked about how much he loves Joanna Angel. I think he cried a couple of times, actually. He's I'm very <laughs> like he's very like sensitive and like but like, oh, my God, we love him for that. Dude, He's so great. Yeah. I don't think there's anybody who doesn't love small hands. Mm-hmm. Fuck, dude. <laughs> Fuck. I hate, I'm sorry to break your heart on air. <laughs> it's OK. My heart's broken. It's all right. I'm just going to shoot girl, girl from wherever. I know, right? Oh, no. We're all just going to have to give it up. Fuck it. Fuck it. Um, what do you think is the most challenging thing um, that you have, that you do now as a director? Like, what is one of your biggest challenges? And then what's one of the greatest rewards? Um, one of the biggest challenges, <clears throat> I would say for me, the biggest challenge is probably having to coordinate everybody last minute because mm-hmm. everybody in porn likes to wait until like three or four days before to like pull their heads out of their ass and like get their shit together. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so like me being included. So like it, it'll be like a week before the shoot and now we're having to like button down all the details. And I think that's probably the most stressful part is just all that pre-planning that goes like right before the shoot like okay what are the last things that we need to get what do I need to run and do blah blah Mm -hmm. blah 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 and then having to balance that with also shooting myself um and performing still Mm -hmm. it's a little bit hard because then I'll be on set like trying to coordinate you know five ten different people like okay you go get this you go get that you go get this and then I have a director behind me like okay we need pretty girls and I'm like ah yeah 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 yeah. (laughs) so I think that for me is the most stressful part is finding that balance um but uh, other than that, I think the most rewarding part is that once it's all said and done, watching all of that chaos come together full mm-hmm. circle and then finally seeing the final product, that is probably hands on like the most rewarding thing. And creating content that people are proud to be a part of, I mm-hmm. think, is is the biggest reward for me is having people turn around and be like, wow, like I love the thing that you directed of me or like I, I love the pictures or I, I just love that scene. I think this is the best scene of my life. Like things like that to me are great because I want to make content that girls are proud of because mm-hmm. I know there's so much, so many videos out there of like, oh, like young teen and pigtails, like da 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 Or like- Which you've shot a few of. 
<laughs> or or just something ridiculous, you know, yeah. or something that's like a little bit humiliating that you're not really that proud of mm-hmm. that, that's out there. So I want to shoot stuff that girls can actually show other people and be like, look at this thing that I did. It's yeah. really cool. And I look amazing in it. And I feel sexy in it. And look at how great I look fucking in it. And mm-hmm. and that for me is probably the best, best yeah. thing about it. So do you have like a real sense of female empowerment than being able to do that and work behind the scenes and I mean you're definitely working for a company that is run by women Mm -hmm. powerful women and is about power so that's a like intoxicating mix yeah I I mean I love it uh I mean we still work with men on our set too Mm -hmm. and it's a it's a very good balance because I think that everybody can equally give input Mm -hmm. um where it's needed because there's definitely times that like I look at my cameraman and I'm like hey, from a guy's perspective, like, yeah. what do you think about this? Yeah, yeah, because yeah. sometimes I might be focused on something completely different. Mm-hmm. And at the end of the day, like, that might not necessarily be as important as what we're trying to sell, and that's sex. And right. sometimes I need a male perspective to, like, totally. look at something and be like, hey, maybe let's shoot it this way, or hey, let's try that. Yeah. Or So it's it's a very good balance, and I think just bringing women to that equal playing field yeah. with men is really what's great about what we're doing, and yeah. that everybody works side by side, and there's no like, there's no weirdness, and it, it's just um, it's cool that so many people want to be a part of it too. Like so many girls reach out to me and are like, "Oh my gosh, like I want to I want to shoot for you guys. Like I would love to be a part of it. Like da 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 da, or even just wanting to shoot content with me mm-hmm. and like." Because I do my own little stuff on the side too. But Mm -hmm. I think all of it is just great. Like pushing girls and showing them that, hey, like there's so much stuff you can do in this industry. Like Mm -hmm. you don't have to just perform or you don't have to just do this. Like there's so many things you can do. Yeah, it's definitely opened up for women a lot. It's really great. It's great Mm -hmm. to see. All right, we're going to take a quick commercial break and we'll be right back. If you're here, it's probably because you're a fan of my podcast, Holly Randall Unfiltered. Well, that's great because I'm a fan of my podcast too. Now, if you don't know what Patreon is, it's a crowdfunding platform that allows people to make contributions on a monthly basis. Because this podcast costs money to make, maybe even more so than others. I'm obsessed with quality. So since the beginning, I have always recorded in a studio, had a professional sound engineer, and recorded professional video. All of these things cost money, as you can imagine. And I also made a pretty scary decision this year to cut down on my directing gigs so that I could focus more on this podcast, which is why I need your help now more than ever. But don't worry, I'm not asking you to give me something for nothing. In exchange for your contributions, I offer so many perks. For example, access to the live streams of all of my interviews, a bonus podcast that I do called My LA Porn Life, Q and A's where the stars answer your specific questions, behind the scenes interviews, merchandise such as mugs, shirts, and stickers, access to my private Snapchat, and so much more. You can join for as little as $5 a month and help me change the way the world sees the adult industry and sex work. So take a look around and see everything that I have to offer. I really hope that you'll join and be a part of our little community. Okay, so we're back. So I, I really love um, seeing, you know, how you've progressed. I, I know you've gone through some difficult times. Mm-hmm. And I really wanted to have you on the show because I saw you were directing and I saw you producing some really new content. And I've also seen you go through a lot. And I love the story of, you know, women who – have hard times and who come back and reclaim their power. Cause that's also my story. You know, I've struggled with alcoholism and relapse and all that stuff. So I've been through that cycle mm-hmm. and you know, that, that redemption and coming back is like so powerful and amazing. And I think it's a great, important story to tell. So do you want to talk a little bit about yeah, all I would, of that? I would love to. Um, so just to give, the people listening a little bit of backstory so they know what we're talking about. Um, I believe it was in 2018. No, 2019. Mm -hmm. Um, Nope, 2018. (laughs) I had to check the date on my arm. (laughs) Um, 2018, I went through a really, really tough year. Um, 
in the December leading up to that year, I had a really, really bad miscarriage. Mm -hmm. And um, because of that, I was I had to take off work um, unexpectedly um, and was charged a lot of money uh, for canceling shoots and was put into a really, really bad financial situation. Um, I was able to get out of it at the beginning of 2018 and kind of come back to shooting. Uh, but I was still really depressed from what had happened to me. And at the time I was 22, 21-ish. And so I had never been pregnant before. I'd never gone through a pregnancy or anything. And so dealing with losing it and like how traumatic it was, it was like one of the worst experiences I had ever gone through. Um, Dealing with how traumatic it was afterwards was just really hard for me uh, at 21. And on top of that, like my agency was putting a lot of pressure on me to just mm -hmm. continue to perform at the level that I was performing at, which was at the time I was shooting maybe 20, 15 times a month. And it's a lot. It's a lot um, for any performer, yeah. um, for any human being. I mean, being on set that much, you barely have any time to your to yourself, you know, um, Basically, what I was doing at the time is I was just going to set, coming home, and just, like, smoking until I basically knocked out just so that I could wake up the next morning, go to set, shoot, come back home, smoke until I pass out. And then it was just the same cycle over and over and over again. I wasn't really dealing with— um, Yeah, you weren't able to process no, the trauma. I was just putting pushing it to the side, pushing it to the side, right. pushing it to the side because I was just trying to perform, trying to perform— uh, keep to the level that I was at uh, before all this had happened. Um, and then also just having a public eye on you during all of that, having to pretend like you're okay all the time, it, it just, it sucks. Like yeah. it, you already feel like you have to act because you're being called a name that you're not. You're already having to feel like you're having to act around all these different people. And then on top of it, you're having to pretend that you're happy too. And it's just like, it's just a miserable cycle to keep going into. Right. And uh, eventually I just cracked. Um, it was like May of 2018. And I actually was at that time I had started to take Xanax a lot because now the weed wasn't really doing it right. for me. And I was just I was still having to perform and still having to perform. So I started taking Xanax and I was like, this is great. Like, I don't feel anything. Like, mm -hmm. but also in the same sense, I was a real asshole. Like, I was a real piece of shit to my friends, to my family, like, to the person I was with. Like, I was a very, very bad place. Mm -hmm. And um, it was May when it got to a point where I was like, you know what? I just don't even want to do this anymore because I know I'm letting all these people down. Like, mm -hmm. all my friends can't fucking stand me because— I've bailed on them. I've lied to them. I've told them that I'm going to stop doing this, and I just don't. And, you know, uh, it's now gotten to a point where it's affecting my relationship. I know that I'm this person's probably going to leave me because of what I'm doing and da-da-da-da-da. And on top of that, I live in California, which is hundreds of thousands of miles away from my family. And I'm completely alone, and I don't have anybody here. And for some reason, I don't know why this is, but for some reason when you go through a miscarriage. It makes you feel really alone for some reason, or just when you lose a pregnancy, I think in general, I think it just makes you feel really alone because um, it's hard for anybody to relate. You know, it's hard for anybody to be like, oh, I get what you're going through unless they went through the same thing. Mm -hmm. And even then it's, it's kind of hard to explain because everybody's situation is, is different. Right. So I was feeling extremely alone and I've, I just felt like I couldn't I didn't really have an option, so I ended up trying to take my life by swallowing a shit ton of Xanax, and it didn't end up working at all. And I woke up the next morning, which I wasn't planning on doing, and I actually had a shoot that day. And I was so out of my mind that I actually tried to go to my shoot. Oh, my God. <laughs> I actually was, like, packing my my shoot bag yeah. and was, like, zipping it up, and my boyfriend at the time was like, no. Like, you're insane. Like, you're not going to set. Like, I know what you did last night, blah, 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 blah. And, like, you need to call your agent and, and tell him what happened. Mm -hmm. And so I did. I, I told my agent what happened. I was like, I'm an idiot. Like, I fucking, I tried to kill myself last night, da, 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 da all this stuff. And, and he tried to charge me a kill fee for the day. <laughs> the irony. <laughs> Anyway. Of the name. <laughs> no shit, right? I'm like, I wish. No, I was kidding. Anyways. Um, so <laughs> that's besides the point. So I tell him, and he basically told me, um, I'm going to have to take you off the site 
And mm-hmm. until you get your mental health back up to a state where you can perform again, I'm not going to put you back up on the site. Now, however, with these lovely porn contracts, you're not allowed to shoot or do anything, anything, work right. for anyone um, right. unless it's through your agent. Right. And he was basically saying that I was off the website. So that meant for the next you three, weren't working. three months, I wasn't going to be working. Right. Luckily, at the time, I only had probably two, three months on my contract. So it was really easy for me to uh, just kind of like sit and wait it out mm-hmm. versus, you know, some people who have two, three years sitting mm-hmm. on their contracts still. Uh, so I, I took a break from porn and I, I took a step back and I took three months off to really just kind of regather myself and take time to heal what I wasn't healing uh, prior mm-hmm. to that. And it was hard. I'm not going to deny that I I went through a lot even just in those three months following it because it was really hard because everything came out publicly. Then it became the, a social media thing and uh a lot of my girlfriends told me that I should, you know, go out against Derek. And then I ended up doing that. And then it became like a whole entire media circus. And then it became just constantly my accounts getting taken down by this team of people that were trying to make sure that all of these things weren't being said and da, 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 da. And so it was a really stressful three months. And I, I didn't really do a lot of healing because mm-hmm. of how stressful it was. And I just kind of threw myself back into porn after three months. Um and uh, once I got back in, um, I just kind of went back to my old ways mm-hmm. of just like, I'm just going to put this stuff to the side and like, I'm just going to hunker down and work and focus and focus. And uh, that went on for like, I would probably say six months. And it really wasn't until 2019, like beginning of 2019, that I really started to get my shit together again after my suicide attempt. Uh, I was back to performing and I was back to shooting, but I was so skinny. I was like maybe a hundred pounds when I was shooting. And like, you can tell in the pictures, like my- How much do you weigh now? I weigh 120 now. Oh, wow. Like 125. I can't imagine you losing 20 pounds. I know. And it's like, it was like my face was sunken in. Like you could see my rib bone. Like I was just, I looked really, really unhealthy. Mm -hmm. And um, I think the worst part is, is that when you start to get skinny and- I think any modeling industry, it sucks that people will say positive things about it. <laughs> oh my God, I was just having this conversation with somebody the other day. I, it really sucks because in, then in your brain, you're like, oh, I'm, I'm fine. Yeah. Like, and yeah. so I genuinely really thought I was okay because everybody was telling me I looked great. They're like, your abs look great. Like, mm-hmm. But you could see my abs because I was s- starving. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and so um, I really thought I was okay. And then it wasn't until like beginning of 2019 that um, I went home by myself and I had a conversation with my dad and he was just like, you don't look like yourself. He's like, I know you and like, this isn't you. And like, you just you just don't look like yourself anymore. And I was like, I know. I was like, I don't really feel like it. Like I feel, I feel sad. Like, and he's like, you need to start changing things. He's like, you need to figure out what you want to do in this industry, like what you want in your life, who you want to be a part of it, who you want to be surrounding it with. And like, he's like, you really need to take that into consideration. He's like, that's why you're feeling the way you feel. And then when I got back to LA, I I made a lot of changes. Like I, I really tried to, to fix a lot of things around me. And, um, I, I got out of the environment that I was in. I was able to kind of stand back up on my feet by myself. And, uh, even though, like in that process, I had to go through like a bad breakup and like losing some friends and, you know, some tough shit. In the long run, it it pushed me to do so much better because then it helped me pursue what I really wanted to be doing, which was directing and shooting my own content Mm -hmm. and creating stuff that's really beautiful. Um, And so I started to focus my energy on that and just creating really beautiful stuff and uh, stuff that I was proud of that made me feel fulfilled to be in the industry. Right. And I think doing that and changing it from just kind of like a means to an end to something that I'm more passionate about is was really my biggest turning point in my mental health for yeah. me. Um, and just the people I was around as well. That was, that was a huge, huge factor. Yeah, absolutely. There's, um, I was reading uh, something about what makes human beings happy and it's it's not money 
<laughs> Surprise. <laughs> Shocker. Um, but one of the the greatest things that, that make people happy is um, a sense of purpose. Mm-hmm. And a, a sense of having a place in the world and that you matter yep. and that you're creating things that matter or you're doing things that matter. And that sounds to me like that's what you found. Mm-hmm. And it's been uh, doing this has also given me a newfound appreciation for the industry and just everybody that's a part of it. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas like before, I, I kind of saw it in more of a negative light, whereas now it's kind of changed my perspective to a more positive one. Do you think it's because you feel like you have more power now, more like agency over your career? Like what? That's definitely helped. Change? Definitely having more power over like my brand and my agency has yeah. helped. Um, I definitely feel like being able to navigate my own ship has definitely changed my perspective major. Because mm-hmm. leaving, leaving my agency, after that, that was kind of the first step to me really healing. Mm-hmm. Um, because I think for the two years that I was in the industry initially, I there was a lot of shit that like, I just was putting off to the side and yeah. it was kind of like running away from, including my, my hometown and shit back home. And so I think once I was on my own and really was handling myself is when I kind of finally was able to deal with all of that mm-hmm. and instead of pretending to just be Adria Ray, I was able to finally be myself, which then made Adria Ray better because then Adria Ray became more authentic and not just this random person that I was just trying to make like, okay, yeah, whatever, porn star. It's No, it's something more. It's I want to be a, a woman in the industry that other girls can look at and be like, you know, hey, she went through shit, but she came out and she's doing better and now she's actually doing stuff for the industry and just because I'm a performer or just because I'm this or that doesn't mean that I can't do the same. Yeah, that's, I think, one of the greatest gifts of dealing with personal tragedies like that is knowing that you can come through it and knowing that your experience can help other people. Mm -hmm. That was, for me, like when I was going through my relapse and I spent four and a half years trying to get sober and I was like filled with so much self-loathing and hatred and just failure constantly trying to get sober and constantly relapsing and and I was like what you know and I I liked I truly like to believe that everything happens for a reason but when you're in those really dark moments it's hard to believe that it's really hard but you know what I kept telling myself was like all of this that I'm going through it's just I'm going through it because I need to experience this so that one day when I meet somebody else who's experiencing the same thing I can tell them like it's going to be okay. Mm-hmm. Like I went through the same thing and you're like, you're going to be fine. You just got to keep trying. So what do you think is like the greatest lesson that you learned from that whole experience? I think my greatest lesson was to really take a look at myself and what I was doing in situations. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I played the victim a lot. Yeah. That's never going to get you anywhere. I played. And the, it's such an easy default. Yep. Thing to do. I, I played the victim a lot when I first got in, and uh, just being young, you know. Yeah, I think totally. it's I think it's just being young. You you really think everybody's out to get you um, mm-hmm. because your parents aren't there to protect you anymore. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh, um, for me, my biggest my biggest growth in all of that was really taking a step back and saying, "Hey, like, what what did I do to make that situation worse? What what was I doing?" that was really leading me down this path of Mm self-destruction. And that's that's exactly what it was, is I was just self-destructing all over the place. And everybody was telling me it, but I was just being a jerk and was saying that they were being mean to me. You're not being accepting or you're not being understanding. I'm going through a lot and da-da-da-da-da. And it's like, yes, we all go through a lot, but even when we're going through stuff, we still need to be able to take a step back and say, what am I doing? How can I make this better? What steps do I need to take to get myself out of this? And I wasn't doing any of that. I was just, I don't know. I think I was expecting somebody to do it for me or yeah, something. Yeah, But I didn't know who. I was like, maybe someone will come along. Yeah, and save you, right? <laughs> yeah, but yeah. It, no one is going to. It's, it's only you that's going to yeah. do it. Which is why it's so important to take responsibility, personal responsibility for what's going on in your life. Because when you fall into that victim role, first of all, like, you're automatically taking all the power away from yourself because it's almost like you're behaving like you can't, you have no power over what's happening to you in your life. You exactly. Know? And there's definitely situations where people have little to no power. But 
once you start looking at things from a different perspective and taking personal responsibility, then you can start changing things. Because the thing is, is that sitting around, sitting and waiting around for things to change for you will never happen. Mm -hmm. You cannot control the world. You cannot control the things that happen to you. You cannot control how other people behave. The only thing that any of us have any control over is how we behave Mm -hmm. and how we react to things. So if we take a really hard look at ourselves and look at how our behavior could be perhaps contributing to this situation, then we recognize that you could change that behavior, which will change the situation. Mm -hmm. And I think I really believe in like also manifesting your future. And also too, what you said earlier about, you know, changing the people that you were around, that is also it. Because I think that when you change your behavior and you start to manifest a life that you want, you start to behave in a way that you wish other people behaved, then you attract different people to you and in your life. And I think also different opportunities because people want to work, you know, productive people, um, good people want to work with other productive, good people. Mm -hmm. They don't want to be around negative victim playing people. Exactly. So when you change your behavior, you change the world around you simply because the people of how you're navigating now exactly and the mm-hmm. people and opportunities that are attracted to you shift mm-hmm. i completely agree with that and uh it it definitely took a lot for me to kind of like come out of that daze um and uh i i, I think the biggest thing for me is that um when you're in that mindset it, it's so toxic that it starts to take over every part of your life, like you yeah. were saying, and that once you kind of finally start to break out of it, that's when you kind of realize. And then you can also realize the people around you that are also doing it because when you're that way, you attract people that are that way. Mm-hmm. And then totally. you, you kind of start to realize like, oh, oh shit, like that person does that same shit to me all the time. Mm-hmm. And that's not healthy for me. Like mm-hmm. I need to, I need to change this. And this year has also been a really big year for me of trying to mend relationships with people that I've affected with behaving that way Mm -hmm. that I did while I was in that kind of toxic state. And that for me has been one of the most rewarding things about this is just being able to uh, come to like a common ground with people that I thought in my head that I had really ruined a lot of relationships with, but understanding that people are a lot more forgiving than you think they are and Mm -hmm. if you're just upfront and honest and take responsibility for the shit that you did like people are very receptive yeah absolutely (laughs) they're very receptive yeah and uh this year for me has been the most rewarding in that sense that I've been able to um build a lot of relationships with people that I thought that I probably would have never had (laughs) yeah well I think the people who truly love and care about you they want to see you doing well oh yeah they want to see you improve and i think that you know people can recognize we all go through like hard times like that and i think that most people have had those experiences and i think that if you can come out on the other side like a wiser person Mm -hmm. um who has truly changed and you know really wants to mend relationships then people want to welcome you back in i think in general like we want to see other people do well mm-hmm. if we are ourselves like in a healthy mindset you know of what course I mean? and, like we like to see other people do well mm-hmm. and again let's say i said like i wanted to have you on this show because i saw that you know i don't know you terribly well mm-hmm. but i saw that kind of transition and i was like this is a great like redemption story that i love to tell because i think it gives so much hope and inspiration to other people so um I'm just really happy to hear all of that. Aww. <laughs> that really moves me. This has been really, this has been really nice. <laughs> Good. Good. I'm glad. I'm glad. I always knew you were a smart girl, but like it's, it's you're yeah, you're very wise. Thank you. Like, I appreciate your that. <laughs> um, do you feel like, cause you said, you know, you were really young mm-hmm. when a lot of this stuff happened to you. How do you feel about like the age of girls getting into porn? Do you think oh, it gosh. should be older? Do you think it's I mean, varies person to person? When I was like eighteen and I would see girls talk about it, I would get like really offended, you know, yeah. because I was eighteen. Yeah. And well, when I we're eighteen, everything. we know everything. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I got really offended, and I was like, mm, like they're just mad, like, but I'm young and beautiful. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but now that I'm 23, I'm I, I get it. I 100% get it mm-hmm. because um 
you're dumb when you're 18. You mm-hmm. are. You, like, you re- like, you're not, but you are. <laughs> like, you're not as, de- as emotionally and mentally developed as you are later on. You're not as aware of how big of pieces of shit people really are. And I think that's really what it comes down to. And I teeter-totter back and forth on this because it's like, it's damned if you do, damned if you don't. So it's like, damned if you do get into the industry and you get all this industry or all this experience, but then if you don't get all this experience and you you don't really know who the assholes are and da 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 So it's, I think it's bad in the sense that there's some girls that don't ever end up learning. Mm. Um, there's some 18-year-olds that come in and they don't end up learning who the assholes are and how to navigate and they don't ever end up getting back up on their feet. They just kind of get chewed up by the industry. That's for me where I think that it, should be 21 because Mm -hmm. I feel like at least you've gone through a little bit more of life or maybe a couple more jobs where a boss was mean to you or something and that you can kind of navigate being around a bunch of people that don't have your best interest at heart Mm -hmm. because nobody here really cares about anybody besides themselves. And Mm -hmm. I, I hate to say that, but that's what it comes down to. And at 18, you think everybody cares about you. But they don't. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. They don't. They just care that if you're giving them a check or not. That's right. really the only thing they care about. Right. And I didn't really realize that until I went through all that stuff with my agent that I was like, oh, I am literally just a number to you. Mm-hmm. And I took it really personally at the time. And looking back at it, I laugh now because it's like I was I was so naive to take it personally. Mm-hmm. Like it, it's not me. It's not yeah. it's not who I am. Right. It's not our relationship that we had. It's it's business. Like yeah. it comes down to money, to numbers, to who what we said on this day, to what we said on that day, to what we agreed on. To it's not about, oh, I really think she's a nice person, so we probably shouldn't do this to her. Like mm-hmm. and so I think in that sense, that emotional development from 18 to 21 is was huge for me was just realizing that I oh I really am in on in this all on my own mm-hmm. though some people like never get it like some people never grow up because I I hear you on one sense and I agree with you for sure like mm-hmm. you definitely know more at 21 than you do at 18 and you definitely know more at 25 and then 30 and you know and now that I'm 41 I know everything of course I'm the wisest woman on the planet. <laughs> but there's also people who just get it earlier like I actually had Sasha Gray on a little while ago and she got into the industry when she was 18 and she like knew exactly what she was doing Mm -hmm. like she came in with a plan she had a purpose and she like executed it and she got out and now she has like a successful mainstream career yeah like she knew at 18 like there there was no fooling that girl Mm -hmm. but that's not common I think Abella Danger is another good example she got in really young Mm -hmm. and I think she like you know kind of knew what she was getting into um but but that doesn't happen a lot. But then there's also like 30 year olds in the industry and they have like no, no idea, idea what's going yeah. on and they never figure it out. Exactly. So it's just like I think the entertainment industry in general, not just porn. I mean, God, the worst is, I think, is the entertainment industry when it comes to like child stars. I was just about to say it. That's I was like Disney worst. stars and like Disney stars the worst because that's a crucial age yeah. of development, mental development. And you're putting these kids in the position where they're catapulted to this fame that most people, you know, who are adults don't know how to handle. And you're around so many different adults all the time. And everybody has control of your life. And then, like, you you can't have a normal life. You don't know who's your friend or who, you know, wants to be around you because you're famous. Like That, for me, I think would be the hardest oh. is that you're not around kids. Yeah. Like, you're not around kids of your own age ever. You're just no. around adults telling yeah. you what to do all the time. So it's like, how are you not going to grow up fast? Yeah. When you're just constantly around people that are like, do this, do that, do this, do that. And how do you, like, figure out who you are under the microscope of the fucking world? Especially now with, like, social media and the internet and everyone's got a camera on their phone. I mean, fuck, dude, that's got to be... That, I think, is, like, the most damaging thing. Oh, for sure. Like, forget porn and 18-year-olds. I mean, 18 year olds. When, I was, when I was in middle school, this is a, a fucking horrible story, and I pray to God that I never have daughters for this reason. But when I was in middle school, I was talking to this older boy. He was a freshman. Mm-hmm. And, of course, like, I went to a super, super small school, um, 
it was like maybe 300 kids total. So our middle wow. school and our high school were together. Mm-hmm. Like our buses drove the high schoolers and the middle schoolers home together. I went to a similar, I went to a private school that was, yeah, like and, seventh grade to 12th grade. And it was yeah. like maybe 300 people in the entire school. Yeah. And uh, and so I would always see this, this older high schooler boy, even though we weren't in the same school, I would always mm-hmm. see him all the time because it was the same campus. And... Um, of course, like me being young, a younger girl, I want to impress him and da 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 da. And so my stupid ass, I sent him a naked picture. And that naked picture became like the naked picture of like the entire school. Like it got sent all the way wow. up to the seniors. And it became like this huge epidemic because it was like 18 year old boys had my naked picture. I'm like 13 at the yeah. time. And like just that alone, like I didn't go to school for a month because of it and it was all just because of fucking I I mean obviously now looking back on it I'm the idiot who took the picture and fucking sent it out to him thinking trusting a fucking 14 year old boy yeah but you don't know any better no you don't know any better you have to go through like people fucking you over to be like oh no one has my best interest (laughs) yeah absolutely Uh, and and that goes back to what I was just saying about the porn girls is like it's hard for me to say no because it's almost like You almost have to get in and go through all the shit in order to learn. Mm -hmm. And then if you don't, then you just never will. Mm -hmm. The scary thing is, too, I think uh, Missy Martinez said this, and I thought this was really a smart... um, uh, (laughs) Perception. (laughs) Fuck, sorry. My (laughs) words just float away sometimes. Perspective. And she was saying, you know, the thing about like being 18 years old and like being in porn Mm -hmm. is most 18 year olds like go to college. Yes. Right. And they get to go to college and make all those stupid fucking mistakes and like fuck all the wrong boys and get get wasted. Get chlamydia for the first time. (laughs) Like just do all the dumb shit that college people do. Find out you have herpes. Yeah. Like fight with other girls and all of this stuff like plays out on a college campus, which is perfectly normal. Mm -hmm. And the only other people who know about this drama are your peers Mm -hmm. but you go into porn and all of a sudden all of that like stupid drama that would normally play out like in in college college happens out in porn porn on this social media platform you get famous real quick and everybody's talking about you i mean you obviously you had this experience Mm -hmm. and so your your personal like growth and your traumas and all that nonsense that stupid shit that we do when we're young and, yep it plays out on this very public stage yes and that's really tough yes like really tough it and was. i mean dude in college i did the dumbest shit the dumbest i'm so fucking glad <laughs> i didn't grow up with the internet or cell phones or social media i swear uh, to god i feel so fortunate for that mm-hmm. and i feel like i feel for you guys like yeah. this it must be so hard to grow up as a young woman in today's society now. It was definitely it was definitely difficult like being in so young and like you said having all of your your traumas kind of put on display. And then also you add on top of that like god forbid you're dumb enough to get into like a relationship with somebody else that's also public because then it's just now that all of that's magnified times mm-hmm. two. And I I went through that while I was going through my my suicidal mm-hmm. shit as well, where I was proposed to on this really public scale in this really grandiose way, and it was all over social media, and it was in front of all these people, and it was filmed, and da 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 da, and I was put into a situation where I didn't, I couldn't say no. <laughs> of course not. <laughs> I, I, How could you? I couldn't say no. And and then I, I ended up being in a situation where I, I really didn't plan on it. I mean, I, I said yes to a person that I'd been dating for less than a year. Yeah. And on top of that, we'd never had like a conversation about like, hey, like, what are your taxes like? Are you in debt? Like, because if we get married, like, your shit's my shit. <laughs> All the unsexy shit about yeah, getting married. Exactly. Yeah. Like, we never had like a real conversation. Right. Like an adult conversation yeah. about what the fuck was we were doing yeah and uh I I mean I was just kind of this question was just kind of dropped on me and then it was filmed and then it was plastered all over social media not even I'm not even kidding not even 
an hour after it happened, it was already on social media. Of course. So it's like, wh- there's nothing that I can do. Like, yeah. you know, my family's involved. My mother's posting it. My, you know, my father's there. Like, I- oh. <laughs> oh, that hurts. And so for me, it was it was really overwhelming. And it was also a, a major learning experience for me because now going forward, if I ever go through that again, I want it to be so private. Yeah. I want it to be so private. I don't want there to be any cameras. I don't want it filmed. I don't want to look back on it later. Like we yeah. can fucking tell somebody. Like I want it to between me and that person. Just yeah. God forbid, God fucking forbid, you know, something happens. You know, yeah. I don't I don't need a million people involved in my business anymore. Yeah. And going down that path, I thought, oh, this is great. Like, you know, being open and being myself, like da 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 da. But you can still be yourself and still be open without involving so many people. Yeah. And being more private. And that was one of the a huge lesson that I learned <laughs> <laughs> the last five years is that I am just need to keep more to myself and that people don't really deserve as much of me as I think they do. Yeah. And yeah. that some things are just for me. Yeah. And like, that's a huge one. <laughs> right. That's a huge one. That's definitely going to be just for me moving yeah. forward. Or you could just be like me and you could be married twice and never have ever been proposed. To. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> yeah. Hey, I'd rather be married than just be proposed to and then never make it to be married. <laughs> yeah, I guess. I guess that's a good point. I did make it to the wedding both times. Well, the <laughs> wedding at the fucking courthouse. It's fine. I'm totally not bitter about it at all. It's totally cool. <laughs> I got a ring, though, this time. Hey. I didn't get a ring last time. I got a ring this time. Anyways, enough about me. <laughs> Oh my gosh! Thank you so much for coming on. Of course, um, you are you are lovely. I'm a, I'm a bigger fan now than I was before. <laughs> I'm glad. I'm glad I can make you a bigger fan. That's really the only reason I came here. I was like, I hope she just likes me more. Oh my god, I like you so much more. Mission accomplished. <laughs> <Good>. <laughs> the drive down here was worth it. <laughs> I know everyone complains about the drive. I'm sorry, I don't live in the valley. It's okay. I scheduled it perfectly with my my travel plans. So. Yes. You're going to LAX, right? Unfortunately. Yeah. That's actually right by my this house. This is actually the least uh, miserable part of my day is this. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, with the coronavirus, the airport oh. might be completely empty. So <laughs> I- <laughs> Lisa Ann took a picture of an airport a couple of days ago and it was literally completely empty. I was like, this might be a great time to travel. You know, actually, I hope they keep the Corona propaganda up so yeah. that I can get all my shit out of the way. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? It would be very nice. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much again for coming on. Can you tell everybody where they can find you on social media? Yeah. Um, any pluggables you want to plug? Um, you can find me on Instagram at Real Adria Ray while it's still there. And you can find me on Twitter at Adria XX Ray. And you can find me directing new scenes over at deeper.com. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Adria. It was so good to see you. You guys can find me at Holly Randall on Instagram and on Twitter. Turns out I found out recently I'm shadow banned. So um, I'm there. I swear to God. Welcome to the club. Yeah, oh, fuck, dude. Sucks. I was like so <laughs> careful about what I posted too. Like on Twitter, I wouldn't post anything explicit. Mm-hmm. Doesn't matter. Social You're media. You're still friends with us. And you have a vagina. <sighs> oh yeah, that's true. That's that's my biggest problem. <laughs> it always gets in the way. That thing. <laughs> oh God. Yeah. Huge, huge problem. Got to do something about that. <laughs> and you can always support this podcast, of course, at Patreon.com/slash Holly Randall Unfiltered. Thank you guys so much. We'll see you next week. <laughs>